You know, we've uh, we've taken a couple of, of weeks, uh, the last couple of weeks, to look at Palm Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's always good uh, when you're going through a study like we've been going through First Peter, just take a step back, to take a step back and look at what you've learned, process it, think about it, apply it to your life. And uh, as we're jumping back in, a couple things I just want to know. First Peter is a part of the whole Word of God. And so what we've been talking about the last couple weeks with Jesus being pronounced as king, with Jesus dying on the cross and ra being raised from the dead, we've already seen that in First Peter. We've already seen uh, the, our, adoration, our adoration of the king. We've already seen the impact that the, the crucifixion and resurrection have had. The whole Word of God speaks to the truth of God as one combined story. And yet, First Peter is a letter. It's a letter written to people, specific people, in this case, in what is modern-day Turkey, at a time when the church was spreading, and there was persecution and suffering and questions about, how do I live a new life, a life that's different than the world that I used to live in? Now, before I go to be with Jesus, how do I live in this sojourning in this passing through time. And then finally, as, uh, as we look at this, we're starting in chapter 3, and our, our division, the divisions of our Bible are not originally in the letter. He didn't, Peter didn't stop and write a 3, and then a little verse 1. It's a letter, so he's continuing thoughts from before. And even though we've taken a break, we're going to be looking back so that we get the flow of that letter. So I invite you to take your copy of the scriptures and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 7 this morning. If you remember, Peter is starting to describe how do we live a life before the Gentiles, before those who don't yet know Jesus, in a way that they, even though they speak poorly of us, may glorify God. We see that in chapter 2. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak of you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so, as Peter's describing this, how do we live as exiles? How do we live in transition here while we're waiting for our eternal home and yet walking amongst those who don't know Jesus, who maybe would give us a hard time for knowing Jesus? Maybe you've experienced that. Peter has talked about how we relate to the government, to those who are in ruling authority over us. And then he talked and got a little bit closer to home and talked about employers and employees and the, the relationship there. And said, even if you don't get uh, everything that's coming to you, if you are treated unjustly, how do you live in light of that because of your new life in Christ? And now he's coming even closer to home. And the, and the relationship between husbands and wives. And so please follow along with me. As I read chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one by, with one without a word by the conduct of your wives, of their wives. Excuse me. When they see your respect and pure conduct. Do not let your adoration be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry or clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as to the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This is the word of the Lord. Every word of God proves true. Peter, I think, is helping us to see that wives and husbands should show honor to each other in order to honor Jesus. As we go into studying this passage this morning, would you go to the Lord in prayer with me and ask for his help? Father, we ask, Lord, this morning that you would come by your spirit and teach us through your word. Father, we ask that as we 
are challenged by it. That we would be able to learn what your heart is for the relationship between husbands and wives. And husbands and wives in situations where there's an unbelieving spouse. But we can all learn, Father, from you this morning as to how we conduct ourselves in such a way that you are glorified in the end. We pray ask that you would help us apply that to our lives this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. A little bit of something to address here. You may have noticed, if you're following along in your copy of the scriptures, there are six verses talking to wives and one talking to husbands. All right. Well, there's a parallel passage we're going to touch on uh, a little bit later in Ephesians where there are nine verses addressed to husbands and only three to wives. So if we're going to count, start counting numbers, uh, that's... That's where I can send you. Uh, but, but both passages help us to see that the relationship between a husband and wife is rooted in what Christ has done at the cross. And so while there are more verses addressing wives in 1 Peter chapter 3, there are several things that are packed into that verse 7. And we'll try to unpack them for you this morning. These verses unpack, or excuse me, expose a wide range of, of topics for both women and men, for both wives and husbands. Peter is writing to a culture that's similar in some ways to our own, yet very different. Women were less free to secure employment or income. Uh, they're, in many cases, considered second-class citizens. And they often needed a husband or a man in their, in their life who could provide for them, who could provide cover for them because of that lack of ability uh, to have income or physical safety. And so, into this, we are going to look and see what does God want for Christian marriage. Christian marriage is designed to honor Jesus. Christian marriage is designed to honor Jesus. Scripture reveals that marriage relationship is a display of this covenantal relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. It is rooted, if we go all the way back, the need for the need for Christ to come rooted in the fall. Before the fall, everything was very good. God made Adam and made Eve a, a helper suitable for him. And he brought them together. Adam and Eve were in right relationship with each other. And they were in right relationship with God. They were, in a sense, co-regents in creation. They were given the task to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with image bearers of God, reflecting his glory throughout the earth. But then something happened. Eve was deceived and took from the forbidden tree, and she ate the fruit and gave some to the husband, her husband, who was with her. It's often easy for us to put all the blame on Eve, but in Romans, it is by Adam's sin that man falls. There's a culpability in Adam that he did not stand up for his wife, that he did not lead her as he should have. This united family unit fell together because they were united together, both guilty, both sinning by not honoring God or the role that he'd given them. Genesis 3 verse 16 tells us some of the, the curse that fell on the woman, Eve. God says to her, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. We see in that curse, we see a tension between who is going to take the lead role in the, in the family, in the home. The desire is going to be contrary to the husband, and he will rule over you. This broken family unit, this broken brokenness is needing to be fixed. And so, as all things do, this brokenness points to our need for a Savior. And we see as Jesus comes and he restores things to himself, that the gospel is evident in marriage. It displays the unity between Jesus and his church. It shows undeserved forgiveness, restoration, Submitting one's will to one another, valuing the purposes of God in creating man and woman. 
love within a committed relationship and uniting of different people into one. I mentioned Ephesians chapter 5 before. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 tells us that we are to submit to one another out of reverence, out of reverence for Christ. And then Paul goes on in that letter to talk about men and women, husbands and wives. He talks about children and their, and their parents. He talks about relationships in the workplace, much like Peter has done. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. There's, a, there's something in Paul's writing that points to the headship of the husband is a role in the home, even as Christ is of the, the church. But there's also a, re, a, a reference to supplying what his body needs, supplying what the wife needs, supplying both physically and spiritually. Paul goes on in verse 25 and says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a high calling for husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church that extensively. And so entering into a covenant of Christian marriage is entering into an agreement with God about the roles he's lovingly assigned to man and woman to strengthen and build their home, bless their home for good, and as a testimony of a changed life. Scripture is not as concerned with a one-way relationship but rather a mutual relationship. Juan Sanchez writes in his commentary, God designed male-female relationships to be a beautiful dance where the man leads and the woman follows. When two people know how to dance, they are of one mind. The man anticipates where he will lead the woman, and the woman anticipates where she will be led. But, like dancing, it is easier said done. If you have been married for any number of days, <laughs> even, even just a couple, you probably know what that means. It is difficult to bring two people together in a unified dance. Over the years, those of you who have developed that, that relationship, you know it becomes more of a flow. You start to remember that. And we get some clues as to how that dance looks based on what Peter writes in this passage. So let's go ahead and, and look specifically at 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 7. The first thing we can see is that wives are to honor their husbands. Wives are to honor their husbands. Peter speaks first to wives in addressing this beautiful dance. And he tells them to be subject to their own husbands. Look at verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Remembering back to verse 22 of wives submitting to their husbands as to the Lord. In this case, Peter makes the example of a wife that perhaps has a husband who is not obe obedient to the word. That is somebody who is not a believer does not walk in the way of the Lord. And yet we can, in a marriage where both uh, husband and wife are following the Lord, we can still learn much from this passage. And I would say even for those of you who have not yet been married or are looking forward to being married, these are some very helpful things that you can put in into practice in your thinking and in your life. This idea of submission, uh, we don't like we don't like it at all. Our society does not like the idea, especially in American society, we don't like to, to submit to anything. We have an independent spirit. I can do it by myself. Don't hold that door for me, I can do it. And yet, in submission, we're talking about, especially biblically, it's best understood as the voluntarily yielding of your rights or will to someone else's wishes or advice as an expression of love for that person. Submission is rarely a problem in a home where both partners have a strong relationship with Christ. Each is concerned for the well-being of one another, where they are trying to outdo each other in showing honor. 
Our example is Christ who submitted his will to the Father and we honor him by following that example, considering the other person first. It's the simplest way to define this submission. You'll note also that wives are to submit to their own husbands. This is not a general call for all women to submit to all men. Now certainly there are situations where some women need to submit to men. For example, as we saw earlier, when Peter was talking about those who are in authority. If there is someone who is an authority over you, yes, you are to submit to their authority, whether in the workplace or in the government. And it doesn't have to be only Christians that you submit to. Call us to submit to pagan rulers and to non-Christian bosses. But women, excuse me, wives are to submit to their own husbands. In a world that valued women as less than, the early church valued women as much greater. In 3.28, there is no, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I'll tell you, as I talk to some pastor friends, this topic of wives submitting to their husbands is not on the top ten list of things to preach about. <laughs> There is a, there is, especially as I said, in our culture, a twisting of this. There is the idea that submission is not a good thing, but there is also the idea that the scriptures teach that men are to dominate women, that men are to control the home. That is foreign to scripture also. Men are to lovingly lead their wives. And though some people have distorted both of those concepts, we can't get around the fact that Peter told wives to submit to their husbands. And that fact is, the fact that the teaching is not popular is no reason for us to discard it. There are some good things, some beautiful things, as we'll see, in submission. How does a wife submit to her husband? Well, Peter goes on and says it's because of her respectful and pure conduct. Some wives try to control men and even manipulate, convince them to become Christians by nagging them with words. Well, you're not going to be a Christian. You're, well, Jesus wouldn't do it that way. Well, I can't believe you, 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 you do that. Uh, my Savior wouldn't do that. We try to con control things through words, but Peter calls on wives to do that without a word. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't talk about the gospel or the good news. In fact, we just, we know from studying earlier that that is how people are born again through the imperishable word of God and so it's not not talking about the gospel but rather it is adding to the fact that you are saved the way of your life that you live before them the means for wives to display a changed life for, from Jesus respectful this word means without fear or excuse me with fear and it harkens us back up to what Peter has said about how we are to work in our workplace, how we are to live amongst authorities over us. If you'll remember back earlier in chapter 2, that we are to honor everyone, show everyone honor, honor the emperor, fear God, love the brotherhood. This respect and fear, even from a spouse that does not know Jesus, is coming through for a wife that is trying to honor God by submitting to her husband, even when the spouse is not honorable in their conduct or fails to be obedient to God. There is a respect that is to be shown to that person. And then purity, committing to undefiled living, no questions about improper actions or unfaithfulness to either God or to their spouse, so that they are being able to be seen as someone who is respectful first to God and then to their husband and then living a life of purity living a life of unquestioning devotion along with that outward living Peter says don't focus on outward beauty look at verse 3 do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry for the clothing that you wear some women try to control men with words, their husbands with words, others try to control them with physical beauty. If I can only, only look a certain way, then, then I'll, I'll keep him. 
there's only a certain way that, that he'll be pleased with me. Maybe it's through wealth. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, referred to women at this time period who bore one or two fortunes in their ear. <coughs> so in light of this, we're going to take a little moment here in our, in our, in our service this morning. Uh, if you are wearing jewelry uh, of any kind, you can place those in one of the offering boxes <laughs> around the edge. Oh, Ruth, uh, that half. <laughs> need to focus on what, what the Word of God is saying. So we'll wait while that happens. No. I'm, I'm glad you get I'm glad you get it. Peter is not saying don't ever wear jewelry. Don't wear nice clothes. Don't wear don't do anything with your hair. What he's saying is don't let that be the focus. Don't let that be the means by which you try to win your husband for Christ. Or Focus on how to build a life with him. Instead, outward beauty fades. Or it can get extremely costly to try to maintain and it distracts us from what's very, really important. What really what makes someone more and more beautiful as the years go on. And that is, do focus on inward beauty. Focus on inward beauty. Verse 4 tells us, but let the adorning, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. This gentle and quiet spirit is not someone who is reserved and doesn't say anything. A gentle and quiet spirit, when troubles come, when maybe conflict comes in the home because of someone standing for the things of God and someone not standing for the things of God, handles those things in a gentle manner, a strong, gentle manner, a quiet manner, handling conflict instead of panicking with confidence. These things are developed over time as the Spirit of God works in the life of a believer and changes their heart to no longer respond in a fleshly or a sinful way. And I would add to this, men and fathers, is this the type of woman we are teaching our sons and our grandsons to look for in a spouse? Is this what we ourselves appreciate most in a woman? A imperishable beauty, a gentle and quiet spirit, someone who cultivates the hidden person of the heart. And are our hearts then in tune with the heart of God because he sees these things as very precious. Peter goes on and says to wives, follow biblical examples of good wives. Verses 5 and 6, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to, to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I don't know about you, um, it's been a long time since my wife has called me Lord. <laughs> But Peter is, re is referring back to Genesis chapter 18, verse 12, where Sarah is not 89 years old. She's, she is uh, way past the childbearing years, and she overhears a conversation the angel is having with Abraham. And she hears that she is to have a child within a year. And, and verse uh, 12 of, of chapter 18, it says, So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, Am I worn, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Here she is all by herself overhearing this conversation. She's not talking to Abraham. She's not calling him Lord. She's not saying that to impress the angels. She's saying it to herself. But in that, Peter grabs on that. He says, Sarah understood that Abraham had a role in this family and she honored that role even though she was just talking to herself she referred to him as her lord by alluding to genesis 18 12 peter indicates that sarah respected her husband even when he was not in her presence that her heart had cultivated a gentle and quiet spirit and that wives are to look like sarah and then what are they to do with that they are to do good and not be afraid. 
then verse 6 says, And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I always love the end of that. Don't fear anything that's frightening. That, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. What's he talking about here? Well, instead of living for yourself, do good. Even though there are times at home that maybe will cause, uh, cause fear. Maybe it's things that, that come up specifically even because you have a spouse that doesn't know Jesus. There may become a time where your submission to your husband is hard and you may feel alone in your walk. Do not fear, but do good. Seek to be a good helper to him. Be kind to him. Express life and joy in Christ. And understand that there may be a time where your submission to God means that it has to take a priority or precedence over submission to your husband. That will also be hard. But God is faithful. And he will supply all that you need. So as we've looked at these six verses, we've seen the, the, the result of a, of a wife's threefold reward. Possible salvation of her spouse. Preciousness in the sight of God and the reward of trusting herself to God. Wives should honor their husbands to honor Christ. And, verse 7, we got there. Husbands are to honor their wives. Husbands are to honor their wives. Likewise, in other words, there may be certain situations where husbands, you are the Christian, you are the one who is a believer in your household. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with your wife in an understanding way. What does this mean? It suggests a deep desire to understand your wife, to get to know her more than just a surface level. It suggests a sensitivity to her need and a desire to respond to those needs. To know your wife takes more than just to know her name. It takes more than just to know her favorite pizza topping or her favorite cereal. Do you know the things that motivate and inspire and encourage your wife? Do you know the things that bring fear into her? Things that trigger a response? Do you understand the way that she is going to respond to act? Part of the joy of marriage over many years is to develop a knowledge of each other. I know how this person is going to act in a situation because this is, because I understand them. And in understanding them, it means that we seek men, husbands, to meet their needs. Some ways that we do that. Peter goes on, he says, to show your wife her value. Show your wife her value. This giving of respect and honor comes out of the living with understanding. It's not simply a nice guy thing to do. It's the husband's recognition that her place in your marriage has a priceless and a precious value. It involves esteem. And it suggests the giving of respect because the wife is precious to the husband. Show your wife her value. And show your wife her value as the weaker vessel. Protect your wife from yourself and other things. Weaker vessel? We don't like that language either, do we? Oh no, I'm a strong vessel. I can take it. Weaker vessel does not denote emotional frailty or less resolve. Men are physically stronger. And in the culture that Peter is writing to, men can provide for the needs of their wives in ways that the woman could not. Ephesians 5.23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body is himself its Savior. Talks about that caring for, that providing for, that protection and provision. Men, don't consider yourself the stronger vessel 
in a way that causes you to dominate, but rather as one who can protect and provide. Maybe us guys would like to think of ourselves as a big old cast iron uh, kettle. Husbands, think of your wives as fine china. Protect, care for, treat her with great value and love. Both have important roles in the house. Husband should seek out the needs of his wife and seek to fulfill them where she cannot. And then another reason to show value is to remember who you are together in Christ, that she is a heir with you of the grace of life. In no ways are wives inferior to their husbands spiritually. In fact, in many homes, the wife is more knowledgeable spiritually. But this is another part of the role of the husband as a leader in his home. Husbands should join together with their wives as fellow heirs, recognizing their value that Christ has come and has given them a new life. So husbands should honor their wives to honor Jesus. Finally, what happens in the home has eternal consequences. One result of Christians doing good works is that some unbelieving people will, in the end, give glory to God. There are eternal consequences to what happens in your home. Your spouse will see Jesus in you, whether they are a believing spouse or not a believing spouse. They will get to see the effects of a changed life in Jesus in you. Here the unbelieving husband is the one who observes the conduct of the believer. Perhaps even one who had at one time spoken evilly about him. Your unbelieving spouse may be saved eternally. There are some men who are entering heaven, perhaps even today, who are giving God glory to God, who owe their life, their salvation, to the honorable conduct and good deeds of a wife who determined to live out her life in real, costly, faithful submission. The story that uh, was told uh, by Kent Hughes of a, of a daughter who observed their parents. The mother was a believer. The father uh, walked forward at a church gathering and said that he, he wanted to follow Jesus, but there was no evidence of any change in his life. He would take them to to church on, on Christmas and every once in a while and stick around while he waited for the service to be done. 29 years of marriage. Six years in, the wife learned that the husband had been unfaithful. Through tears, this daughter observed the mother dealing with this. And as she read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the unbelieving spouse, the, the, the believing wife was to, to stay, or the believing husband was to stay with the spouse. She said, that's it. I, I, I'm in this marriage. It's not what I wanted. It's not what, what I was hoping for. But I'm here. 29 years later, at the age of 72, this man went forward and gave his life to Christ. The change in his life because he has observed his wife sticking through, he observed her through ups and downs, through hardships, led to him saying, there is something about Jesus in my wife's life. And he himself gave his, his life to the Lord. He began to study the Bible together, pray together. Six years later, the husband died and the wife died about five years after that, both going to see the Jesus that they loved. Certainly the gospel message was, was foundational and crucial. Words were said, but it was the husband observing the wife's life that led him to the Lord. Another way that we see eternal impact on what happens in our homes is that we get to please God with something that he loves. Remember back to verse 4. So you adore to be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which in God's sight is very precious. In God's sight is very precious. And finally, that your prayers are not hindered or ineffective. Hindering means to interrupt. Interestingly, this word is your prayers are not hindered. So people think that that includes the family's prayers, the husband and wife's prayers together. That they would not be hindered. The act of praying together is one of the most difficult things for husbands to cultivate in a marriage. But whether you're praying <coughs> together with your wife or your own prayers, how you treat your wife matters. And it matters eternally. So I would ask you, have you put up barriers in the way for your spouse to see the Lord's impact in your life? Have you cut off examples in silence or withheld your inward beauty? Have you lived in an ignorant way with your wife, giving up on knowing her more deeply? Whether you are in a marriage relationship now or not, you can cultivate the inner heart. You can put on display the changed life that God has for you. I know in our congregation, some of us have been divorced in the past. While you're not under obligation to submit any longer to that former spouse, I would ask you, have you continued to display a transformed life in your relationship with them? When they think of how you respond, do they think of bitterness and anger? Or do they see that even in the midst of conflict, in the midst of hardship, that your life has been transformed by the word of Christ. We are going to gather at the communion table in just a moment. The communion table is a remembrance of what Christ has done, how he has taken two very different things, a, a sinful people, a people who is in rebellion and enmity with God and has united them to the perfect lamb, the lamb without spot or blemish, the one who gave his life willingly, laid down, submitting to the Father's will. We remember this because it is in this that we are made one, one body in Christ. It is his sacrifice on our behalf that we observe.